Hello, hello. Welcome to this episode of The Creative Pause. My name is Susan Padrone, and I am here with my co-host, who I will allow to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacey Fay. It's so good to be with you today on this episode. We're so psyched today to have Sarah Rafferty with us, who is going to walk us through cyanotype process and how to make a beautiful art print. But before we do that, um, I wanted to always take a moment just to remind us of why we're here and what the show is all about. So we're here to just take a moment to breathe, to connect in, um, to hear some other voices in your day. Um, I know as a mother of small children, for me, this is always a time to say, oh my gosh, there's adult humans out there <laughs> who are doing interesting things. Um, so whatever this time gives you, whether it is connecting in, listening in, learning something, or just tapping into your creative spirit, uh, we're glad you're with us today. And we always start with a question, and Susan's going to lead us in that. Yeah, so our question today is, what has brought you the most joy in your recent explorations? And, you know, Stacey and I were talking about what question we wanted to bring to this episode. And, you know, we were aware that more and more people are slowly starting to venture outside of their home, whether it's more in their immediate surroundings or taking road trips um, and just exploring um, and finding joy in however great those explorations are. Um, for me, I, I took a road trip down to the Outer Banks in North Carolina with my family. And basically we just quarantined in a beach house as opposed to quarantine, quarantining in our house. And um, I mean, I always get so much joy from the ocean, from the beach. That's absolutely my, my place to recharge. It's where I hope to have a house or some kind of getaway someday. It doesn't have to be the Outer Banks, just any kind of beach ocean connection. Um, so just, I remember when we, when we first arrived and I like stepped onto the sand and like being with the ocean and just felt like, <sighs> like I'm back, you know, and it felt like a great recharge and recharging moment. Um, so yeah, that definitely brought me a lot of joy in that, that exploration. Stacy, what about you? Yeah, so I haven't had the chance to go on a road trip yet. I'm hopeful and have lots of daydreams of it lately, but a lot of my explorations have been right in my immediate surroundings here around my house and around my neighborhood. And I have a garden and that's been the way that I've received a lot of joy lately. So even earlier today, I was out in the garden and um, any of you who have gardened, you know that sometimes things just all of a sudden pop. You know, one day you'll have nothing and the next day you'll have all these things happening in the garden. It's very exciting and magical. And so today was one of those days where yesterday, you know, we thought we had picked all the cucumbers and then today there's a whole bunch more and we a lot of squash that's almost ready to pick and tomatoes, which are coming in, weren't sure. Um, <laughs> this year was the first time I grew tomatoes indoors and transplanted outdoors, and I waited way too long. So I was like, oh, I think I killed my little tomatoes, but I didn't. And they're actually like <laughs> developing fruit, which is amazing. So I think a lot of my joy lately, uh, and explorations in general are sort of right outside my front door in the garden, and there's just a lot of magic there. So Sarah, how about you? What have you been exploring lately, and where are you finding joy in that? I really, I love what you both just said. It just like speaks to my heart so much. Um, I think road trips and adventure and being in nature are always like my top joy-filled moments and really connecting to something like bigger than myself feels significant, especially right now. But um, I, I would say two things, definitely my garden. Um, I think Stacy, you and I connect on that garden, um, the magic of our gardens and um, I would also say the river, being next to the river and in the river and like walking like around bodies of water just like always, always brings me so much joy and peace, like just this feeling of calm and relaxation. So in the summertime, I tend to take our walks um, with our dog through the river. <laughs> That's kind of our thing because she gets super hot. So I love that. Our our dog that we have, he's a, a lab and um, we used to take him to a dog park that had water going through it and he would just like romp through it and loved it, like just absolutely lived for it. Um, we haven't gone to the dog park recently, but he, I like that. I, I think it's 
even more special when you have that kind of connection with your your dog or your pet when they can share those like those joys with you it's like oh you like water i like water oh this is great <laughs> i know it's kind of silly but it's i definitely resonate with that too sarah thank you um i had another thought and i lost it so i'm just gonna keep going um <laughs> so I am going to pull up the quote that Sarah shared with us. I'm gonna do a quick screen share to get that in front of us. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, there we go. So it says, in nature, not only does one cog connect with another, everything is also connected by a network so intricate that we will probably never grasp it in its entirety. And that is a good thing because it means that plants and animals will always amaze us. So Sarah, what is it about that quote that made you want to share it with us today? This quote I found in a book that my husband gave me. I actually have the book. Um, it's called The Secret Wisdom of Nature. Oh, it's backwards. Um, but it is just this like kind of scientific um, book about nature, but this is part of the introduction. And I felt like it was my heart in a quote. Like that is exactly how I feel all the time when I'm in nature is that it's like, I'm so tiny and it's so intricate and how it all relates. It's just like, I constantly am in awe of like all that nature provides us. And I feel like it connects us, grounds us, inspires us. And it's like, it's just what I'm all about. <laughs> yeah, I love this quote, Sarah, and it, um, I think it's very apropos for this time, especially. I know me and even people I know who are not very nature inclined are finding a lot of solace in nature right now because I think it does remind you, first of all, that nature always is moving forward and always is creating something and, and you know, at a time where we often can feel like we're not moving ahead. But it's also, again, that magic, right? Of like, it's just continued amazement at a time where we need it. We need that, that kind of inspiration. Yeah, I know that I've said, that we've both said on this show um, numerous times, it just Stacy and I, about how, how much we rely and have been relying on nature or animals or both during the last several months. And um, I think it's, continuing to find that amazement and appreciate that amazement that allows us to continue to have those like little, little joys every, every day, everywhere you go, no matter if you're not leaving your property or you are, you can still have that, that moment for yourself, which is really beautiful. Awesome. Well, you all have heard a lot from Sarah already, and we've gotten, I feel like we've talked a lot about nature already, and that's very much the theme of, of today and a lot of the work that Sarah does. So it's, I'm very excited to have Sarah with us and to introduce her formally um, to you all. So Sarah Born Rafferty is consistently inspired by the natural world, as you heard, whether it be her garden or um, a lot of trips and adventures that she likes to take to mountaintops far away and, and other far off places. Um, she creates botanical prints using the cyanotype process. So Sarah is the founder of Atwater Designs and we'll share all of Sarah's information at the end. And I highly encourage you to go to our website because the work that she creates and the artwork that she enlivens is, is incredible. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the cyanotype process is one of the oldest photographic processes. So she's really bringing back um, an older tradition of photography and doing so through exploring nature as well. Um, in addition to Atwater Designs, her business, Sarah is also a teacher of photography to high school girls. And she finds that working with students is really integral to her process and is a point of inspiration as well. Um, Sarah's work with Atwater Designs has been shown nationally and internationally. Um, and she uses her business also to give back. So a portion of her proceeds give back to land and water conservation organizations in southwestern, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. So uh, Sarah's work's beautiful and she's going to give us a little bit of an inside glimpse today into what she does and how she does it. And, um, you know, we talked of magic, but very much sort of the magic behind the curtain of, of how she does what she does. So um, Sarah, I'm so excited to have you with us and I'm going to pass the baton to you. 
Excellent. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to show you guys how to make a cyanotype in the speediest way. <laughs> um, it's going to be, Stacey and I talked a little bit about a cooking show. So we're going to pretend like this is a cooking show for a cyanotype. Um, I'm going to show you, it's basically like four steps. Um, the first of which is to create um, your mixture of solution, which um, I'm going to supply in the notes, um, a, like a little resource guide so you know where you can get this stuff. But um, cyanotype comes in a part A and part B solution, and it's just a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, I use this like old beaker to measure one-to-one, -one, but you can, um, you can just use like a tablespoon or a, like any, really anything in the kitchen. And this is a non-toxic um, photographic process. So you should be careful, but you also like, you know, don't be careful, but it's not, it's not really bad for you. So I'm going to create just a one-to-one solution and then I use this dish that um, is kind of low but you could put it in like a plastic cup or you could put it in anything really um, where you can then put your brush into it so here's the solution it's kind of like a yellowy color not blue <laughs> um, and then I use foam brushes but I also sometimes use these um, I don't know what these brushes are called, but um, you can use one of these or foam brushes. And I take my foam brush and I dip kind of like making sure that it's wet. Um, sometimes you don't realize like if you have enough of the solution on your brush until you go to brush it. Um, but what you want is basically this kind of thickness across your whole paper. So um, not too heavy of a, of a brush, but not um, too light either. I recommend heavy white paper. So I use printmaking paper, you can use heavy watercolor paper, um, but the fun part about cyanotype is you can really use any um, organic material. So you can use fabric like a cotton or a silk. You could you can do it on wood, which is really cool if you do it on like a slab of wood. Um, when you use different papers, I recommend something heavy just so that it withstands water, which is what we use to develop it. Um, when you coat the paper, it'll look like this yellowy. You should do it in a semi-dark space. So obviously we're not in that right now because of, we're trying to video this, but um, I usually do this in my studio at night and then um, just let it dry overnight without any lights on and like the windows closed and everything. So um, you can go all the way to the edge, or you can go just in the middle, you can do a circle, you could do a spiral. I mean, it's really up to you. Like that's all the creative process. So once you have this, um, the, your paper coated, I always do a, like at least a couple sheets at a time. The next, you, and you have it dry, then you wanna um, make sure that it's covered because you don't want light to really expose any of the paper. So I wrap mine in brown paper or you can put it in a trash bag or like a Trader Joe's bag um, and have it ready for the next step, which is collecting your plants. I love my garden, so I just collected a bunch of things from my garden, and um, I usually do the collecting beforehand, so um, all these different plants. I chose some of my favorites, Queen Anne's Lace, for the print that I did, and so I have Queen Anne's Lace here, and I'm going to take these Queen Anne's Lace, and I'm going to lay them. I usually do this inside so that it doesn't expose, but I'm gonna lay them on my dry paper. And I do this inside so that I don't feel, oops, sorry. 
Um, I do this inside so that I don't feel too rushed about it. I want to make sure that this paper doesn't get exposed to the UV light. Um, that's what that's how it changes is the exposure to UV light, which is our the sun. Um, and then once I'm ready, I'm like, I like the composition, then I'll take it outside. Okay. So when you take it outside, I tend to put a piece of glass over it. So I just use um, like an old piece of glass, um, you know, from like a picture frame. I like to taste the sides just to make sure that um, it doesn't, it helps it to not break. And, you know, just in case there's little divots in it, it won't hurt you. And then you put it over to basically press the flowers to the paper and expose it. The, in good summer sun, which is like today, um, although when this airs, it might not be as sunny today, um, you want good high summer sun. So like hot day, you know, during daylight hours, not too early, not too late, about five minutes. Now that changes as the sun changes. So um, sometimes like you just have to experiment. The more experimenting, the better. This, is, this process is all about like being in nature, having fun and experimenting. Um, so I um, today expose it for five minutes and this is the magic. I exposed it already, so we were ready for this dem demonstration. And then um, the next thing you need is a water bath. So a water bath is just a pan of fresh water. And the fresh water can be from the sink. It doesn't have to be, or from the hose. doesn't have to be fancy. And um, it's just water. This is how you develop the prints. So once you've exposed your... Um, paper for five minutes or about five minutes. Do some experimentation, see how long it be. Um, it will look a totally different color. So it'll look like this. And you can kind of see a little bit of the Queen Anne's lace there. Now I'm going to submerge it in the water. And then this is what still every time I do this, and I do this a lot is totally amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> and it'll go from, you know, sort of like a almost silvery color to it'll start to change into this blue. And then um, wherever the plant was, that will remain white, the white of the paper, because it didn't get exposed to the sun. So that chemical or the solution, the cyanotype solution, it doesn't get exposed, so it continues to be water soluble. So when you develop it in the water, it just washes away. And then where it was exposed to the UV light or to the sun, that's what will turn blue. You want to wash this. Um, basically until your paper runs clear, the bigger the print, like the more washing you have to do. Um, and sometimes I like to just put it down and like kind of give it a tap, leave it, go do another one, come back. I would not leave it for too long because you can overwash them. Um, but this is basically what happens. The last step, is um, I usually use clothespins to just um, pin the print on um, like a twine, like laundry line outside and let it dry in the air. This will get a little bit darker blue as it dries. So I recommend before you um, make a whole batch of them to do an experiment or a few experiments on a, on the time and let them dry first so that you can really get the time that you like like maybe 4 minutes if the sun's really strong or maybe 10 minutes if 10 minutes if it's kind of a cloudy day but it's all about experimentation that's it <laughs> uh, that's so beautiful i love how the Queen Anne's lace, they look, they look like a, like fireworks in the oh sky. Yes, I love that.
<laughs> it just looks like a happy little celebration is happening. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> it totally does. Um, Sarah, I have a couple of questions. One, do you have to dry the flowers before you put them on the paper or does it not matter? Um, no, like not, not at all. Um, I'm going to switch to the other one. Is that okay? So you can see yeah. my face. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll give Sarah a minute to make that, that change so we can see her beautiful face in addition to her beautiful artwork. Um, but yeah, Stacey, I had that same question too. And I feel like now that we're flower drying, pressing pros, like just in our <laughs> class from uh, the interview that we did with Ecoboda, um, who was also named Sarah, right? With Ecoboda? Yeah, yeah, she's also Sarah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, we've had a lot of Sarahs on the show too, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, I was curious about that too, if the, the flowers had to be, or the plants had to be pressed or dried prior to incorporating them um, for Sarah's artwork. They do not have to be dried. You can dry them, you can flatten them for a little bit, um, but you definitely don't need to. I usually use like straight plants that I've like just picked. Like my, my sort of range of um, activity is like coat the paper the night before. And then like, if I know the next day is going to be really good weather, then I'll like start the process with a whole collecting, walking in nature, doing the, like what we kind of started talking about when we started the program, like, um, that sort of peace filled moment. And I get so excited by that, like collecting flowers and putting them in jars and having them ready to go. Um, and then I usually just make, make them right away. Um, it's pretty rare actually that I flatten them, but I do one big pro tip about making a cyanotype is the flatter the flower or plant or grass or feather or whatever you want to make, um, the better it will turn out. Like the big kind of clumpy, um, flowers, like this hydrangea, like it would just be like one big white blob, like on your paper. So you might like take it apart and curated a little bit. I feel like that's similar to um, flower pressing too with like ranunculus and hydrangea like while they're beautiful in their natural form like when you go to press them it just kind of like it, I don't know it doesn't have the same kind of effect unless you take them apart and enjoy the the petals or like them on a smaller scale so that that makes sense for sure. Absolutely. There's so much overlap between um, cyanotype and, um, and flower pressing and then like some screen printing sometimes and then like photography, obviously, because cyanotype is like the oldest photographic process. But yeah, there's a lot of overlap. So you have to think about more the silhouette of what you're doing than like a lot of people are like, oh, the veins of that leaf are really, really cool. Um, and that's a wonderful to like think about those you know to like notice the intricacies of nature but those sorts of things don't really show up so well for a cyanotype and sarah can you remind me um you said you you coat the paper and then you let it dry overnight right in a dark place and then you put it in the brown paper bag or do you put that in the brown paper bag to dry overnight like can you uh recap that Great question. No, I usually let it dry. Like I, I'll take my sheet that um, is coated and I'll like just kind of lay them out on the floor and then have the shades drawn and the lights off and I'll just let them dry. Um, and then once they're dry, I like stack them all together and put them in like a light tight container. So it can be a box or it could be a garbage bag, but something where light isn't going to expose the paper. And sometimes like one thing that's helpful is to put them like face to face um, so that light doesn't expose them. Oh, awesome. That's really helpful. So is that so that you can have a lot of paper like ready to go for when you have collected what you're going to be, you know, incorporating and you can just like bang out the next few steps? <laughs> Absolutely. I find that it's, there's a good mistake ratio <laughs> to 
<laughs> to cyanotypes. So even if you, like I've been making them forever and sometimes I'll think like, I could do two of the exact same cyanotypes, same flower, same sunlight, same size paper, same like coating of paper the night before and they'll turn out like totally differently because there's so many variables between the, um, how you paint on the solution to the sun, if like a cloud comes over, like there's just so many things happening. And I personally love that, but I think people who are like a little more control freak and they're, they, sometimes they don't like this process as much. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, Sarah, I'm wondering what you've found to be inspiring lately for your art. I know, so Sarah recently did a collection called Slow Mornings, which I loved and I actually bought a piece from the collection because it was a, the, the inspiration behind it, not that I want to speak for Sarah, but my interpretation was it was her sort of slower mornings here in the time of the pandemic and what she found inspiring in terms of the plants that she would notice and stumble upon um, during those slower mornings. And then she made art out of it, which I thought was incredible. Um, so Sarah, I'm wondering, you know, in addition to slow mornings, is there anything else, particularly in this time we've been in, which is kind of crazy for everybody, that's been bubbling up for you of, of art you want to create or particular flowers that you're gravitating towards or ways that it's informed your art? I love that question. Oh my gosh. This time has been so, if so many things, like I, there's so many feelings, you know, one day will be um, totally fine. And I'm like inspired and excited. And the next day will be hard and like confusing. And um, I find that Definitely the plants, like I'm gravitating towards things in my garden because I see them a lot. And um, I think I'm always like pandemic or not, I feel like I'm always um, like part of this whole art and my business is so that I can have an excuse to be outside more. And I think part of me like making this sort of more of my life is in an effort to just find those moments like on a daily basis instead of just like as special moments but just like out of necessity kind of like these this is just so um it's just so important to being alive is to like for me it's really important for me to be able to like notice the beauty everywhere whether it be in my garden or on a walk with my dog or um somewhere not at home <laughs> one day. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, Sarah, like sort of art, necessary art. I know I feel that way about the creative pause. I mean, we created this in this time, I, like, I think because it sort of saved our lives, right? <laughs> like Susan, and kept us connected. It gave us all the things that we needed, and then by default kind of gave other people the things they needed too, um, which I think is, is certainly what your art does. It's beautiful and inspiring for people, but it sounds like, like, first and foremost, it's sort of what you need for yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like a hundred percent. Definitely. Um, I think, um, also just one other thing that I feel like I just have really fallen in love with is part of slow mornings. I know it's hard to, it's hard to say that because for some people they're like, my mornings are not slow. They're insane. My kids are home. I'm trying to get work done. Like everybody's life is so different and so varied. Um, but I, really noticed a difference in my morning in particular because um, I wasn't going anywhere. And, um, and so I took a lot of creative pause in my cup of coffee in the morning. I think like I'm always seeking a moment where I can just sit and drink a cup of coffee. And it's, I love coffee, but it's not even so much about that. It's like the ritual of like starting your day in this ritualistic way that um, kind of sets the tone for the rest of the day. So that's like another thing that's not plant or business related, but it's like inspiring me and bringing me some joy. Uh, yes, I am a, a fellow coffee lover as well. And I, yeah, I've also taken to that ritual of them or like first thing in the morning, warm or hot cup of coffee and enjoying it and just taking that as my the thing that I do for myself before I start doing everything for everybody else and um yeah sometimes there are mornings my son is an early riser he always has been I try to be 
I feel like no matter how hard I try, I can't wake up before him. Um, and I definitely don't function from like a brain element uh, before he does. And I'll, you know, be downstairs with him and he'll just be like, mommy, can you mommy? I need, and I'm like, mommy needs a cup of coffee. Like not to be that stereotype, but I am and I'll own it, whatever. It's fine. Um, but I'm just like, just let me have like two sips of coffee before you start asking me for things. Like, I love you. I will snuggle with you all morning if that's what you want, but I need my coffee first. And I think that that's my, you know, again, from that like stereotypical, like mommy needs her coffee <laughs> kind of moment. Um, but it's also my way of like tending to myself um, making sure that I'm a little bit of a priority, even if it's just on a small scale in that moment. And, um, whether you're a mom or not, I think that that's a really important thing to do for yourself. And again, it doesn't have to be coffee, but I think it's, it speaks a lot to how you're starting your day with an intention that you're going to take things slow and gradual or at whatever speed feels right for you in that moment. And then you're allowed to have your day develop and bloom however it needs to. Well, that makes me think, Sarah, that, um, and I was thinking this too as you were creating, that this seems like it could also be a really great activity with kids. Um, so for those of us, like Susan and I have kids, a lot of kids, a lot of people right now have their kids at home with them a lot or all the time. Um, yeah, have you found that this, I know you said you do, uh, you've done this with high school students, but have you found with younger kids as well that this is a sort of easier art form or one that they can, um, even if they pick the flowers, I guess, that could be used in it? Have you found that it works well? Yes, I think one of the most awesome things about this process is you could, it's ageless. Like you could do it with a baby and you could do it with your grandparents. And it's, um, I think, the same kind of magic and wonder that like that we all feel and um, I've done it with my nieces and they loved it they talk about it all the time and um, I've done it with older women who come to a workshop you know like host workshops um, with some regularity and then I've done it with my students at school so it's pretty multi um, multi-purpose mul uh, like multi-generational <laughs> there's like a lot of um, there's just like a lot of potential. Um, and because it's um, relatively safe, you know, it's known as a non-toxic um, technique, but I always am like a little, you know, I, I, you shouldn't drink the solution. So like make sure that your kids are safe. Like I wouldn't necessarily have kids coat the paper. Um, I would do that for them. But once the paper is coated, um, you can absolutely involve them. And it's so fun with water and being outside and collecting plants and, um, and kind of letting them find some kind of creative voice is pretty cool. I would think too that prepping the paper ahead of time would also just help the, the kids, especially being younger, stay engaged within the process because knowing my son, he's five right now and waiting is hard. Waiting is very hard. Um, I mean, I'm impatient too, but five-year-old impatience is like a whole different kind of impatience that I am definitely learning about. Um, so if I were to be like, okay, we're going to do this project, it'd be super cool. Like, all right, now we're going to paint the paper and now we have to wait. He would be like, what? What? Like, no, no, I don't want it. No. <laughs> so I like the idea of maybe like not having them involved in that part of the process, doing that ahead of time because then they get to be part of it and it's like just magic after magic that occurs once you're at like through those that initial phase absolutely you just made me laugh so much <laughs> it's so true that is 100 percent true and great advice i will continue to tell parents who are asking me about this process like you cook paper and then you know they can make one like kids are so immediate gratification and so it's pretty awesome that you can get a pretty great result like within 10 minutes, you know? Um, but also like the power of just like, oh, I did one and that was cool, but they could keep doing it if you have a stack of paper that's prepared. So one last question that I have, Sarah, and I don't know if Susan has any others, but um, do you mentioned a feather and plants. Are there any other um, 
materials, I guess, organic or otherwise, that work really well for this process that you've tried or that you've seen works well? Um, yes, absolutely. I only do botanicals because that's like where my heart is. And, you know, we're talking about nature and my business is really about nature and botanical art. But cyanotypes, um, because it's sensitive to the sun, it's anything that could um, cast a shadow and create a silhouette. So um, my husband actually really enjoys doing totally non-organic things like a paper clip and a cord and um, like a paintbrush or like anything that isn't, that has a little variegation in it, you know, that helps to make um, the design like more interesting. But um, if you get a big piece of paper, this is a really fun thing to do with kids, you can have them lay on it like this. And it's so fun because then they get like a silhouette of themselves. Like, you know, they can make all sorts of fun kind of faces and I'm not faces, um, like body, put their body in different positions. I am totally doing that <laughs> with my son. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'll add like where to get a big piece of paper um, in the list that I give you guys. Amazing. And everything that Sarah has talked about will be included in the show notes and the episode notes, whether it's on her, the YouTube video or on our website with the show's um, specific link. Um, so thank you so much, Sarah, for being on with us today. It was such a pleasure watching, watching you make your magic happen. It's just, oh, it was so, so joyful and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's really, it's so fun to share this and it obviously like really lights me up. It's like my favorite thing. So thanks for asking me and having me on. Oh, well, thank you so much, Sarah. And Sarah, do you want to just take a moment to say, um, you know, what is your Instagram handle and website and where could people find you if they're listening to this on, on podcast and don't, not yet in front of the screen to see the links? Um, yeah, my business on Atwater, um, bleh, <laughs> my business um, is called Atwater Designs. So on Instagram, it's just Atwater Designs, all one word, um, and Facebook. And my website is www.atwaterdesigns.com. And it's at a t water a t w a t e r designs with an s awesome thank you so much um, so thank you everybody for being with us today i hope you are feeling inspired and certainly let us know if you create any sanitypes send us pictures please and tag tag us tag sarah we'd love to see what what you're up to creatively so thank you so much. And we always end our episode with the same quote from a Mary Oliver poem, which is, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? So thank you all for being with us and we'll see you in the next episode. Take care. Bye.